For the last 40 years, we've been sold a lie about how to solve hunger. It's the kind of deception that sounds so right, so convincing, that we don't even ask questions. We've been told, and far too many of us believe, that handing out food to poor, struggling people will fill their need and end their hunger. Now, it's true that in an emergency like the fires that ravaged Fort McMurray or during war or the myriad of natural disasters that rock our world with regularity, we need to give them food. We need to hand food to them. Desperate people in desperate straits need food right away. And indeed, the hunger that I've seen working in low-income communities over the last 20 years is a crisis. Four million of our fellow citizens, four million of them, don't know where their next meal is going to come from. One in seven people in the U.S. don't get enough to eat on a daily basis. But I want to be very, very clear. This is a crisis of a different, long-standing order, and we've been throwing food at it for a very long time. We build new food banks and expand the ones we already have. And while these frontline programs, these food pantries, are doing their best, resources are minimal, space too often dreary and inadequate, and they rely heavily on highly processed corporate leftovers. Meanwhile, our politicians campaign on giving tax credits to these companies. We establish walkathons to raise food. We check out hunger at the grocery store. We've created an entire ecosystem of food charity. And it is so pervasive, it makes us feel like we've done our part, makes us think the problem is solved. And yet nothing, absolutely nothing, could be further from the truth. The numbers of people unable to put food on their table continues to grow at an alarming rate. Food bank users are some of the unhealthiest people in our country battling diabetes and other diet-related illnesses. It's become so pervasive that we think that we can't do anything but hand them food. My sense of this issue is that we have to find a way to recognize that people who are struggling, they aren't struggling because they don't have enough to eat. They're struggling because of low minimum wages, inadequate social assistance rates. These are the issues that are at the heart of why people can't put food on their table. Now, I have a friend named Jan Popendiek. She's one of my food movement heroes. And she always said that the way we frame a problem determines the kind of solutions that we get. So if we say that hunger is about a lack of food, then the answer is obvious. Get those people something to eat. But if we ask, what is really at the root of hunger? We discover that the answer is far more complicated and less easy to respond to. That's because at the root of hunger is poverty. At the root of hunger is the 23% drop in income for the lowest earning Canadians. It's in the US federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. In other words, it's impossible for people to afford to both eat and live with health and dignity. Anyone can see that we're not going to solve such persistent problems with donations of canned tea, peas and corn. No matter how well-meaning, the solution lies elsewhere. I have a friend named Glenn who's in the audience today. He's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. He grew up in a family that didn't value education, and he had quit school by grade nine. By then, he was already an alcoholic. He hit rock bottom at 23. He was so sick, he nearly died. But Glenn was one of the lucky ones. He managed to beat drinking and get his life back on track. He worked hard on a fishing trawler in Holland, he worked as a groom at a racetrack in maintenance at a university. Eventually, he ended up out west 
where he created a very successful landscaping business with a number of employees. He had a longtime girlfriend, a nice house, a bunch of cars. Things were great until they weren't. The army base that was critical to his income closed and his business never recovered. His relationship fell apart and he lost everything. Glenn ended up moving back to Toronto and he found that the only place he could afford was a bed bug infested rooming house. He was hungry, depressed, his sense of self-worth completely battered. I've seen this over and over in the community food centers that we're building across the country. People come for the food, but real change happens in their lives because of the connections they forge. Growing food in our gardens, cooking together in our kitchens, sharing a meal in our dining rooms, volunteering in our after-school programs. The people that walk through our doors are hungry, but even more, they are lonely disenfranchised, silenced. They're often without hope. You know, hope sounds like such a soft thing, an intangible. It's something you can't measure or put on a spreadsheet. And yet such soft things like hope and its sister's dignity, self-worth and connection lie at the very heart of both individual and societal change. Glenn got more and more involved at our center, joining the civic engagement side of our work, learning how to speak to the media and politicians about lived experience, how to organize community meetings and advocate effectively. It was a powerful learning process, revelatory for Glenn and others to be able to speak to people living in cir similar circumstances and to acknowledge that their poverty was not their fault. It wasn't a matter of personal choice or poor budgeting. Recognizing that their poverty was part of a larger system of inequality, a system that isn't working in their favor, made them see themselves differently. Together, they began to feel that they could change not just their own lives, but the lives of other people living in their community. And that's exactly what they did. I remember Glenn and the civic engagement crew gathered with signs, drums, and a megaphone to march together to the office of our local politician. They felt he needed to hear how impossible it was for them to make ends meet before they went on to a larger demonstration at the legislature. When the crowd got to his office, they chanted and sang before handing Glenn the megaphone. At, at first, he hesitated and then seemed to grow taller and more certain of himself. He raised the megaphone to his lips and he spoke forcefully. I was hungry yesterday, he said, and I'm hungry today, and the way this government treats us, I'm gonna be hungry tomorrow. It was a brilliant, moving moment of clarity. There on the street, everyone understood the truth about hunger. Not every, it was clear that a single meal or a hundred single meals will never solve the hunger crisis. What's needed is not charity, but solidarity. We need to cultivate this sense of community and belonging that I've been speaking about, but not stop there. We need to take the essential next step, translating our collective wealth into such things as affordable childcare, subsidized housing, and perhaps one day, a basic income guarantee. These are the public policies that have been shown to diminish poverty and inequality. These are the supports that emerge from a society that understands itself as connected. And it's not just anti-poverty activists and low-income community members, but all of us who have a role to play in creating this more inclusive and fair society. And you know what? It starts by taking very small steps in your community. If you have a kid, Join your school council. If you want to live in a welcoming and diverse neighborhood, get involved in your neighborhood association. Volunteer at a local organization that is doing work that you care about. And then just like Glenn did, try to link these local efforts with larger systemic change. Turn that school experience into pushing for equitable funding 
for all schools. Champion the creation of affordable housing, not just in your own backyard, but across the city. Don't be a bystander. It's only by operating in this more public sphere. You need to operate in this public sphere. It's only by operating there that we'll be able to make change. That's the place you have to be, is in the public sphere. I had tea with Glenn not so long ago. After that day at the politician's office, he got a full-time job with good benefits. He started to take photography courses and pursued his passion for art. He's retired now and unfortunately struggles with some very serious health issues. But he's got a clean, safe apartment. The Volunteer of the Year Award from his years at the Community Food Centre is displayed proudly on his wall. He continues to be engaged in his neighbourhood. He's built a community of caring around himself. It's just the kind of person he is. Actually, I believe it's the kind of people we all are. We can't afford to forget that we're all connected. For it's this sense of community that is at the core of forging a society where we can all thrive and where we can all have a dignified seat at the table. Thank you.